Several weeks ago, I've been out a little bit, but several weeks ago, I started a, a series, a little message on sonship. And thus came that sign. The Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men could become the sons of God. And the scripture is in Romans chapter 8 in the Amplified. Romans chapter 8, put it on the board if you don't mind. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. And I want you to come with me quickly now. Come with me and you won't be disappointed. I'm going to take you somewhere very, very quickly because I have something fresh to give you. And um, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 14. And uh, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Qualification to be called a son of God is that son of God is both plural, men and women. To be called a son of God means you have to be willing to be led. If you're leading, you're not a son of God. It's until you surrender and say, not my will, his will, that then you can be qualified to be a son, daughter of God. Go on. Verse 15. Uh, for the spirit which you have now received is not a spirit of slavery, but puts you once more in bondage to fear. But you've received the spirit of adoption, the spirit for producing sonship in the bliss of which we cry, Abba, Father. So the spirit that we've received is moving us constantly towards becoming sons of God. Our sonship is so important. If And I, I titled the message Sonship, but the, 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 the second title to this one is Identification. If you don't understand who you are and identify that you are a son, daughter of God, uh, if you don't identify with that, you're never going to walk in the full dimension of authority, power, and grace that God has provided for you. You must understand that. Your inheritance is secure. I saw a story where a man, and it was auctioned here in Baltimore, a man, his uncle was a coin collector, and he had a uh, nickel that was given to him that he had bought, uh, and, and he had paid just a little bit of money for it, this old uncle. And uh, he was a coin collector. When he died, he left about $800,000 worth of coins. And, uh, but he had this one coin, this one nickel, and uh, it was 1913 on the nickel. Now, here's what you got to understand. That 1913 nickel was uh, a fluke because the nickel, the, Indi uh, the, 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 uh, the nickel with uh, the woman on it, um, What's her name? Yeah, Susan B. Anthony. That woman, they stopped printing that in 2012. Now, this nickel, it, it it's, uh, was in, finally investigated that four or five, huh? I said, oh, no, I meant 1912. I'm sorry, 19. The, the, they investigated, and what happened was the minters who minted this money they printed, after it was all finished, they printed five coins, 1913. Five nickels. With, instead of the, buffalo, uh, the Indian and the buffalo, uh, buffalo, head, uh, buffalo on the back, uh, they stopped that and they took a minute and printed five in 2013. Now, the coin had stopped. Well, that made these coins unbelievably rare. Okay. And it's like they stopped uh, uh, making uh, Kellogg's cornflakes up in a city up in uh, uh, Detroit, or up in Michigan uh, last week. Was it, where was it? Battle Creek, Michigan. Battle Creek, Michigan. They stopped. The last cereal box from that plant was made about a week ago or two weeks ago. And when one of the men, a man bought the box of cereal, he happened to buy the last box, because what happened was some of the employees took the bag and signed their names on it. They were the ones who stuffed it and sealed it and did all the stuff, and they signed it and said the last box. So this guy is now found those guys, and he's given that box back to them because that box will be valuable because it was the last one. You understand? So this coin, this old guy had it, and he had his collection, and he got in a car wreck in uh, 1962, and he got killed. And he was on his way to a show to look at coins and show his coin. And uh, 
he had a, what they said when they investigated, they said it was a fake. They checked his coin out and said that his nickel was a fake nickel. It wasn't the real thing. And the reason is the three on the 1913, the three was not like the others. In the original printing by the mint, their three didn't look like that three. Well, from 1962 till 2000 and something, this guy, uh, his sister, she died, and uh, she left that coin to her son. It was in a brown envelope, and it was just of no value. Well, it became weird because everybody was still looking for the fifth coin. They couldn't find the fifth coin. So he pulled out. A guy here in Baltimore said to a big coin collection, said, let's look at it. You want to look at it? Okay. They offered a million dollars to anybody that could find that fifth coin, just finding it. Well, he took the coin in there. They brought in four expertise guys that do nothing but handle coins. They looked at it, come to find out. It was the fifth one. And it was the three, because what these guys did, they remade the stamp and made the three for those five different. All five of them have the same three. Well, the first guy that investigated it, there it is, the 1913 coin. The first guy, when he investigated it, he thought the three was wrong because it didn't look like all the other ones. You still with me? It sold for $3.2 million, a nickel, five cents. Now, here's a point. When we don't know what we have, that coin has been in their possession since 1962, and it was called a piece of junk. You and I, the world looks at you and says, no, they just, they're dumb Christians. They're just, 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 they're dumb. They're losers, Ah, blah, blah, blah. Little do they know, we are an original product. We are the original coin (laughs) right in the midst of these fakes. And one day, When the real appraiser shows up, the appraiser is going to show up and say, hold on a minute. You see that one and that one and that one and that one. That's the real thing. You with me? Identification. You got to know that you're a son. And then because the son of God became the son of man so that the sons of men, us, can become sons of God. Now, the second message I preached was activation. Once you know that you have an inheritance, and you could read the rest of that in Romans, once you know that you have a great inheritance in Christ and you know who you are in Christ, then you have to realize there's a need for an activation. That means that this thing is so real that you start living it. Acts 19, 19 and 20 in the Amplified. Let's look at it. Activation, Acts 19. Uh, In verse 20, it says something so powerful. And many of those who had practiced curious magical arts collected their books and throwing them uh, book after book on the pile burned them in the sight of everybody. When they counted the the value of them, they found it uh, amounted to be 50,000 pieces of silver and about $9,300. Now, in this story and I want you to see something in verse 20. It says, The word of the Lord concerning the attainment through Christ of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God grew and spread and intensified, prevailing mightily. How many of you know that God wants to so activate your faith and confidence in God that there's going to be a release that will grow. The Word of God will grow in us. It will mightily begin to operate in us, and it will prevail over every circumstance. How do you say, Lord, let the Word work in me mightily? Come on. Can you say it? Let the Word work in me mightily. Let it grow. Let it mightily grow. 
and let it prevail. prevail. Hallelujah. Now, sons of God are going to walk on the earth and demonstrate the power of the gospel of the kingdom until Zechariah 8.23 comes to play. What does that mean? It means this. In Zechariah 8.23, it says, People will grab a hold of you and say, Let us go with you. We've heard that God is with you. How many of you hear that? There's a day, if it hadn't already happened, but there's a day if you'll stop living in the sea of doubt and self-pity and self uh, looking at your selfies and start realizing that you are sent on the earth for a divine reason. And that God plucked you out and saved you for a reason. You have a sister, brother, cousin, mother, somebody not saved, but God saved you. How come? Because he has need of you. He hath need of you. And because of that, there's a day coming where people will come and grab you and say, I want what you have. You've been with God. I know you've been with God. Is that your new baby? Already in church. Jesus, help us. You guys pop them out and come right in the house of God. What is it? I forget. A little boy? Josiah. Bless Josiah, Lord. What's the other boy's name? Samuel. Josiah, Samuel. Maybe we'll get Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Hallelujah. And then when I dedicate them, I can pronounce their name. Thank you, Jesus. God, help us. Sorry, a little sidetrack. Now, let me take you a little further. That's the two things. First is identification. Second is activation. How do you say, Lord, here's my hands. Come on. Here's my hands. Activate my hands where faith is released. Miracles are released. Power is released. Anointing is released. God, put your power in my hands. Hallelujah. The third thing is multiplication that leads to mobilization. So when you know who you are and you've been activated to be who you are, then the absolute multiplication factor takes place. Listen, and I'm going to get right to the point. God's original Great Commission doesn't start with the last chapter of Matthew, Matthew's Gospel 28, verse 18 through 20. That is not the original Great Commission. It does say, Jesus speaking, says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Jesus said that they were to go and teach them all the things that I have commanded you. How many of you know we need to ask ourselves, am I daily by my life teaching what Jesus commanded us to teach? How many of you hear that? Look, saints, we get some of the goofiest, unfounded things in our mind, and we call it doctrine, and it is not true. We build kingdoms around false cultural acceptance points. Hello. And God wants us to start living by this book. Now, where the Great Commission started was in Genesis chapter 1. Do you know it's the first commandment? Hey, hey, get this. It's the first time God talks to the man and woman he made. Think of that. The first time God talks to them, he says, he says this, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, take dominion. You read it. It's there. So they, th- th- this is both procreation, mean multiply the earth in numbers. How many of you hear that? How many of you know that 
that couldn't have meant he made homosexuals. Dr. Ben Carson has it right. You're not born with that in you. There's not a homosexual gene. God didn't make a homosexual gene. That's why Dr. Carson recently said, guys go into prison straight and come out gay. Or they get a transplant. What it really is is sin. And we need to call it sin and stop playing around with it. And you can be delivered. You can be saved. And you can go to heaven. But see, Christianity is trying to make a cultural doctrine. We're trying to make a cultural doctrine that God somehow said that that, uh, uh, marriage uh, consisted of anybody that wanted to. Instead, God made Adam and he made Eve. Hello? Hello? But see, today we want to make a gospel that fits the culture we want. Hello. Do you know we say stupid things about what this gospel says? And it don't even say it. Come with me now. You're going to enjoy this. Now, then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, I believe that had to do with procreation, but I also believe it has to do with God creating man who was going to receive the spirit of God and could carry God's spirit on the earth. Are you listening? That's why Jesus came through the womb of a woman. That's how he became the son of man, so that he could cause the spirit of God to get into the world. Can you hear that? And, and, and you and I need to understand, until that moment, it was illegal. But when Jesus came, he made an entrance for all of us to become sons of God. Are you getting that? Now watch. To make this point today, and this is all I'm going to right here. To make this point, I'm going to take you to a story. I want to use one of the greatest stories in the Bible. I made a reference to it a minute ago. It is especially meaningful to the Jewish people at this time of year. Uh, Of course, it's the story of Esther, this young, beautiful Jewish girl who entered a beauty contest and won it and became the queen of Persia to the king of her excesses. She became the queen of this great king. She was beautiful. I mean, she was, uh, the Bible says she was absolutely gorgeous. Now, so in April, in the story, okay, got to understand, the king had appointed as his prime minister a man named Haman. I'm giving you the history so I can tell you what I want you to hear. The king had appointed his prime minister, Haman, the Agite, who hated the Jews, and in one particular Jew he hated because this Jew wouldn't bow down to him, was a man named Mordecai, who happened to be the young queen's uncle. Now, Haman is in real trouble. He's picked a fight to kill. He put out a decree that because Mordecai and because the Jews were a people that believed different than the king did, then Haman said, let's kill all the Jews. And so... A ethnic cleansing of Mordecai and all the Jews was set and the date was set. What they did was they met together in April and they rolled dice. And that's the word Purim. That's what it's called. The rolling of dice is Purim. You've heard of the Feast of Purim or the celebration of Purim. And when you see that, that word there in Esther, they rolled the dice. Listen, there's an old wise proverb says that you can roll the dice, but God determines how they roll up, how they turn up. Come on. 
And, and so they rolled the dice, Haman and his men, and listen, they set the date one year from then, March the 7th. Friday, a Saturday, March the 7th would have been the celebration of Purim of the great deliverance that God brought to the Jewish people through a little girl named Esther. This was just before Passover. We're getting ready to go to Passover. Now, Esther's divine destiny propelled her through a series of perilous choices and circumstances, orphaned and adopted, chosen and promoted. Boy, it sounds like us. I mean, it sounds just like us. Orphaned, adopted, chosen, and promoted. She found herself locked in the king's house of women, but still managed to win the king's heart and become the queen. Oh, listen, you can be in the house. Let me help you right here. Esther is a picture of the church. Oh, yeah. Esther is a picture of the church Esther is a picture of a deliverer. Stay with me a minute. You're going to get something. And Esther, when you hear her, begin to see her as the church. She was locked in a room full of women. But she found favor with the king. The church has a lot of people. Has a lot of people sitting in the church. But not everybody has found favor with the king. You find entrance to the king when you become a worshiper. There are people sitting in church and they're in the house of the king, but they're just women in the house of the king. I don't want to be just one of the women. I don't want to be just one of the women in the room. You understand? I don't want to be just one of the women. I want to be the one that got in the king's presence. Come on, come on. Orphaned, adopted, chosen, and promoted. How many say, I'm a candidate? She managed to win the king's heart and become the queen. You would think that once you became queen, life would be easy. Boy, that's a mistake Christians make, isn't it? You think, well, praise the Lord. I go to Rock Church. I'm in the presence of God. I'm on the worship team. I'm in ministry, so life should get easy. You fell, you hit your head. We understand. You're suffering. We'll pray for you that God will heal you. Because every time God raises up a deliverer, He has to send them an enemy. You don't get raised up to be a deliverer if you don't have an enemy assigned to you. You say, well, how do you mean? Well, let's take Israel coming out of Egypt. They got a guy named Pharaoh chasing them across the river. They're going to get baptized in the Red Sea. That's what it was about. They're going to get baptized going across. That's a baptism, and they're going across, but they got Pharaoh chasing them. David, oh, David would still be on the side of a hill tending sheep if God didn't give him a Goliath. James, James, you're a big guy. Get up here. Come up here, big guy. Come in, stand right up here in the middle. Get where the light is. Get over there. Now, come here. Come here, son. Yeah, you're going to help me. You want to be a preacher, so I'm going to help you. That's your first day. James, would you mind? Now, James is Goliath, and this is David. And it's about the size difference. But here's what I want you to see. Would you mind laying down? No kid, no giant is ever taller than a kid who's standing up when the giant is slain. Do you understand that? 
This kid is bigger than that giant because that giant's down. And that giant's got a piece of rock in his forehead. Rock Church went right in his head. (laughs) Give Goliath and David a hand, will you? Still with me? Listen to this now. I want to do this right. Remember that purpose always comes with favor and responsibility and always accompanies promotion. Here's what was about to happen. Esther today is you and I remember the church. She's about ready to spend favor in the pursuit of her purpose. You see, she had favor as the queen. She didn't need to take the risk she was about to take. You understand? She's the queen. She ain't got nothing that she's got to do. She she ain't got to be nobody. She can just come to church on Sunday and sit in the chair and smile at everybody. She don't have to stand up and be responsible for nothing. She's just one of the women in the king's house. But what she did was so out of the ordinary. Esther chose to take her favor and invest it in her purpose. See, some of you sitting here today, God has favored you beyond what you should be. But what you decided to do was sit in the house of queens with your favor while the world is being prepared to be hung on the gallows. Haman is busy making a gallow to hang Mordecai and kill all the Jews, all the Jews who that little queen happened to be one of. And she said, you know, I could sit in Rock Church. I could sit in the church and just be part of the church. Sit amongst the queens. I'm entitled to just be there. But Mordecai came. He was a little bit ticked off at her. Read chapter 4. Put it on the board. Verse 13 and 16. Stay with me just a couple of minutes. Chapter 4, verse 13, 16, in the Amplified. Thus Mordecai told them to return this answer to Esther. Do not flatter yourself that you shall escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. Verse 14. For if you have kept silent at this time, relief and deliverance shall arise for the Jews from somewhere else. But you and your father's house shall perish. And who knows but that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this and for this very occasion. What an indictment. Mordecai says it, verse 14, if you keep silent at this time, If you keep silent at this time, if you refuse to sacrifice and let God have your life, if you refuse to sit in the pew while the gallows are being made to hang and kill sons and daughters of God all over the world and all over America. And Mordecai is like a prophet. Mordecai has come and said, Esther, you may choose to be silent. But if you do, get this in your head. God will raise up somebody else to be a deliverer. And he says this. Think about it. You might have come to the kingdom, but for such a moment as this. 
And all the gallows are being readied. And all that the gallows were for was Mordecai and some of his were going to be hung. And the Jews, a mandate was given, kill them all. They would have been eradicated completely. How many of you know there's a harvest out here, saints? There's a harvest of sons and daughters of God that are away from God, out of the house. And there's a mandate being put out by Satan, who is Haman, to kill them. Oh, you got to get it. She then calls for Mordecai and all the Jews to fast for three days. Good God. And three nights. And for her to go in front of the king and for this mercy stay of execution. She says, I want you guys all to fast and pray for three days and three nights because I'm going to go in front of the king. I'm going to go and I'm going to kneel down before the king and I'm going to ask for mercy for the whole of Israel. Wow. Can we fast and pray that God will send the harvest before it's too late? And the gallows are allowed to be built to kill the sons and daughters of God because they're a threat to the kingdom of God, uh, to the kingdom of Satan. Now, most of us, when we have something, we keep the best for ourselves and give little to others. But she was about to trade favor for purpose. Whenever God gets ready to elevate you, he must first introduce you to that enemy. Don't forget it. Whatever God is getting ready to elevate you, do not be shocked that he'll introduce you to your enemy. Maybe the Lord's spoken to you about a great destiny in your life. Remember, the more important your future, the greater your opponent or your enemy will be. If it had not been for an enemy called Goliath, David, come on but always have just been a shepherd. When an army arises, promotion is on the horizon. Come on. Go back to the story and I'll end it. The wicked man named Haman was called Haman, the son of Hamanderdith, the Agite. The Agite? Where did we get the Agite? Who was with the Agite? Oh, yeah. Saul was told to kill And utterly destroy the Agites. But Saul disobeyed and said, no, I'll keep the best for myself. He kept the best sheep, the best cattle, and the best women for himself. And Saul the prophet came, uh, Samuel the prophet came and said, Saul, did you kill them all like you were supposed to? Bah. So what's the point? What's the moral of that? What's the deal with this? Well, I'll tell you what it is. He lost his kingship, Saul did, because of this. And now Esther is all the Jews have to still deal with Saul failed to deal with. You see, Esther is still fighting the Agite that Saul refused to kill. What you don't eradicate when you are strong, you will have to come back and attack it in your weakness. What you don't deal with when you're strong will come back when you're weak. It's the old saying, I think somewhere, deal with your enemy now or your children will have to face your enemy tomorrow. Come on. Deal with your enemy now. Church, rock church, nation of America, we better deal with our enemies now or we're going to have to let our children deal with them. We, we want to let Iran have a bomb in 12 years. Well, after I'm not long in, in charge, no longer around, I'll just pass it off to my children. I don't want my children to have to, my grandchildren to have to fight Iran. I don't want my grandchildren to have to deal with a problem that I failed to deal with. Hello? I don't want to be an escape artist. Houdini? 
I'm tired of Christians. That's all they are is Houdini's. They're, they're professional escape artists. Right when they get to in the front of their moment that they were born for and God sends them an enemy, they escape thinking they can get out and let somebody else deal with it. So we think we can pass this on to somebody else. Look at me. I've been fighting in the church a long time. I've been in this thing 40 some years. I'm no kid that woke up yesterday. And I've been, I've been identifying the enemy, finding them, uncovering them, exposing them, arm wrestling them, throwing them to the floor, rebuking them, casting them out. And I want to sit down now and tell my grandchildren they got to deal with the ones I didn't take care of. I'm sorry. I wonder if the prime minister of Israel didn't have it right when he just said what Esther discovered. Esther soon discovered Mordecai's enemies was also her enemy. Sounds like the prime minister of Israel. Your enemy has become the enemy of your enemy. The only weapon in the Jewish people's arsenal was a queen. The only answer for the America, for the church, is the queen. She sits here today. The weight of destiny hung heavily over this young girl, Esther. She was all they had. Think of that. She was all they had. Your life, Esther, church, may be all someone ever sees of God. You may be someone's secret connection to him. Haman, who is Satan, has set a trap the gallows to hang Mordecai, to snare God's sons and daughters, to wipe out his only threat, the sons of God, from their inheritance to rule with the king of kings. Esther, church, joined by many fasting and praying, became the next great deliverer. question that if you remain completely silent at this time relief and deliverance will arise for God's people from another place but you and your father's house will perish you and your father's house will perish the old, half-committed, burned-out, half-baked church is your father's old house, and it will perish. And God will raise up another deliverer. How many of you know God was going to spare Israel one way or other? He chose Esther. If she said no, History would have wrote it different. We'd have had another page, maybe another book, called the book of Mary, Barbara, the book of somebody. She'd have stepped up and she'd have said, I know I was born for such a time as this. Yeah. Would you stand to your feet today? Before you run out, before you do all your mechanical exercises, and you stop a minute, listen. Father, help us to hear. Mordecai, the prophet. Mordecai is like a prophet. 
he comes to this young girl. He has invested interest in her. He helped nurture her. He helped mentor her. Read your story. Do you know Mordecai has saved that king's life? You got to read it. Mordecai in another battle had saved that king's life and he didn't know it. And Haman, Satan, sometimes can do some of the dumbest things because he thought, if I kill Mordecai, my problems are solved. But he didn't realize you touch Mordecai and the queen is coming after you. Woo! And if you get Look, it's one thing to get a king mad. Well, you get the queen mad. At least in my house, I mean, I don't know. In my house, you can get the king mad, but you get the queen mad. We ain't even eating. Ain't no love going on. I got to be careful. How do you hear me today? When the queen, when the church realizes, could we have possibly come for such a time as this? I tried to bring, we were managed to bring 385 pastors together in the Baltimore City region in this area. Brought them together for years. We went on retreats together. I took some of them to mission fields and took some of them to revival meetings. I took Frank Reed, Dr. Reed, down to Argentina with me. He got hands laid on it, ended up on the floor. He'd never had that happen. He said to me when he got up, what in the world happened? I took, I, I, I took Clifford Johnson in one of those places. I took Bishop Claxton to China where they were smuggling Bibles. God put us together and God worked some things and we were praying over this city. We prayed for the candidate, Mr. O'Malley. He sought us out for prayer. Came and got me at the Oriole Stadium. Asked me to pray for him. Told his bodyguard, get back. I want him to pray for me. I laid hands on him. So when he comes up to high places, I'm going to remind him. Boy, I laid hands on you. We came for such a time as this. But should God, look at me, should God send it? to another? Should God send the next thing he wants to do to somebody else? Because God's going to deliver Israel. God's going to rescue the sons and daughters of God that are out around this nation, that are in bars and in places of ill repute and that are all over this nation, in universities, all over this nation. They're predestined, pre-ordered of God, and they're sons and daughters of God. And God is going to send somebody to go get them. How many of you today would take your favor and trade it for purpose? Can I see your hand? How many of you trade your favor with the queen, the king? See, you've been singing here this morning. You've been entertaining the king. But are you willing to, are you willing to say, I, I want to be in the king's presence, but I must trade my favor for my purpose. Lord, here it is. Put your hand out there. Lord, I declare today, Lord, I give up my favor to be just one of the queens in the king's house. 
And Lord, today, may my life be for this reason, that I came at such a time as this. You can have my hands. You can use my lips. Take my feet and direct my steps. Lord, I thank you today. I'm going to be used. I'm not going to let that son and that daughter go to the gallows. I'm not going to let that son and daughter be killed and taken away. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to become the Esther of my day. I'll give myself to you afresh. Here I am, Lord. Isaiah said, send me. Sons and daughters of God are all over the place that are predestined, set aside by God from the foundation of the world. And they're about to go to the gallows of Haman's wickedness Satan's desire to destroy them. Can God count on you? Can God count on you? Can God count on you? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray all over this room that God, the Esthers in this room, would rise up and say, Lord, here am I. May I not see another one perish. May I not see another one lost uh, to the schemes of Haman, uh, to the desires uh, of Haman and his wicked plan. May I rise uh, and say yes, uh, though I understand that it will cost me. May I step in to the destiny of your choice. Father, today we surrender afresh to you, afresh to you right now afresh to you right now right now in the name of Jesus Esther 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 as your Mordecai today I declare Esther Esther could it be that you came for this reason you came to rock church for this reason. Esther, trade that favor for your purpose and let God be glorified. Come on, let's worship the Lord a minute. Let's really tell the Lord how much we love Him. Let's thank Him today for the Word that's alive. Thank God, thank God. Come on, come on, worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Put a thanksgiving out there. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for the word. Hands down. Please, for a minute, bow your heads. Let me pray. Father, in Jesus' name, all over this room, somebody's here today that know you, Lord. They don't know you. They're not right with you. And God, they may be a son or daughter of, oh my God, a son and daughter of God. And Lord, I would not that they perish. I would not that they perish. For the gallows are already being made. And Satan's orchestrated plan is to take them out. To take them out. That's you. You're a child of the king. You just happen to get away from God. You're out of sight, out of place, out of sort with God. But today... You want to get back with God. You want to get it right with God. Right where you stand. Right where you're standing. No one looking around. Put your hand up and say, Pastor, it's me. I give my life back to God today. Yes, I see your hand. Anybody else, hold it up. Say, it's me, Pastor. I give my life back to God. Come on, put it up. Whoever you are, just put it up there. Say, it's me. It's me. Anybody else? Yes, I see that hand. Anybody else? Hold it up. I'm not done yet. There's somebody else. God is working on you. Just say, yes, God, I've done it my way long enough. I'm coming back to do it God's way. If that's you, hold your hand up so I can see it. I'll pray my best prayer. Hold it up. Hold it up. 
Hold it up. Yes, I see that hand. Anybody else? Quickly now. I'm trying to pray this prayer. Yes, I see that hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Put it up. Put it up. Put it up. Okay, those of you with your hands up, come down right now so we can pray for you. Quickly. Come on, sweetheart. Come on, right now. Right now. Right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Just say, excuse me. Excuse me. I'm going down. Just say, I, I'm, I'm going down. I got to go down right now. That's right. Come on, right now. Right now. Today is that day. Today is that day. There's still a couple coming right over here, right over here. Sweetheart, come on, right over here. Get with her. Yeah, there you go. Somebody else. Here's a coming in the back here. Come on. Casey, somebody. Uh, Darlene, somebody. Come on right there. Get with this boy. Come on. Peter, you can hook up with him, right? Father, in Jesus' name, bless them today. Touch them today. Let this covenant prayer be refreshed today. Let them renew their vows. Let them renew their heart vows to you, God. To be able to say, Lord, I come. I need your grace. I need your love again. I need your tender mercies again. I need to get right with you, God. Well, I thank you for this salvation and for this renewal today. In Jesus' name, I thank you. How many of you are here today? Are you here? Let's give the Lord a little praise. Can you do that? How many of you got the message today? How many of you are going to be Esther? All right, look here, look here, look here, look here. Here's how I'm gonna close today. We got a little extra because I took up so much time with the wall and communion. And I haven't preached to you in a while, so. See, I've been storing up all this, man. Y'all gotta let me preach more often, I'm telling you. Now, here's what I wanna do. I want you to listen, are you listening? This snow event took us out of any kind of good balance range for our existence. We need to recover from the snow. Uh, you gave an offering today. I'm sure it was good and it was wonderful. So I'm gonna extend myself to you today and ask you to do something over top of that. Are you listening? Yes. How many of you know we've missed three Sundays in a row that we've had very small crowds because of the volume of snow and the cold and things. And so. I need us to do what we can today to make a difference. Are you listening? Not too loud. Not too loud with the piano. How many of you are listening? And, and I need to make sure I have some mic here, okay? Here's what I want you to do. Look at me. Look at me. We'll do this. It'll be less than three minutes. Three minutes. It'll be done. Here's what I want you to do. I was praying about it. I said, Lord, what, what do I do? And this is what I felt and how I sensed the Lord. Remember I told you about, are you buying something or are you investing in something? Buying something from God today? Or are you investing in something? Here's what I want you to do. I want to pull up a couple of numbers and you respond and we'll move right through this because we need to get a boost. How many of you understand we need a boost? Come on. Yes. How many of you know, saints, Esther and the whole story has no value if we end up, we can't even support the kingdom? What in the world? Okay. Now, I have a number in my head, all right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't have the pen. You got a pen? Anybody got a pen? Who's got a pen? Give me a pen. Penless people. Oh, I got one, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna write it. Okay, I wrote a number down. It's the number I know God spoke to me about. How many of you love the Lord? How many of you glad you came to church? How are you glad you heard that message? All right, Esther, listen to me. I'm going to start calling you Esther now. If you'd like to, to give in this and help us back, get back to that spot, we have to get ourselves up so that we can't take these dips like this. It hurts the church and our effectiveness. We've just brought in somebody to take over the Can Can Make a Difference ministry. We're excited about that. And uh, we have to be able to supply them a salary and those kind of things. So we can't drop back. Okay? Here's what I need. 
If you want to donate or you want to give today, you just raise your hand and I'll do it quickly. How many of you right now want to pledge, give $1,000? Let me see your hand. I already put mine in this morning. I came with 1000 Yes. Mike, anybody? Two. Okay, I'm going to count. One, two. Hold your hands up again, please. One, two, three. Anybody else? Anybody in the room want to give 1000 uh, Four, five, six, seven. Father, bless this poor group up here. Uh, seven. Anybody else? Did I miss your hand back there? Anybody? Wave at me. Hold hands up. That would do 1000 Seven, seven. She's got both hands up. <laughs> uh, seven, seven. Okay. Did I get you before? I don't think I did. Did I get you before? I did get you. Okay. That's seven. All right. Now, how many of you could really step out and say, I'll help the Lord with a $500 gift? $500. Let me see your hands. Okay. Up here. Anybody? Any guy? Coming along. Coming along. Coming along. Coming along. Okay. There's one. There's two. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Three. Okay. There's three. Anybody? Four. Okay, that's it, that's it. Five, six, wow, that's pretty good, girl. Uh, uh, anybody else, anybody else? That's six, okay, that's six. I got six there, okay? Now, how many of you could do 250? Let me see, all the 250 guys. All the 250s, put your hands up, okay? Come on, come on. Now, look, Esther, you're never gonna go get the lost if you can't take care of the current. Hello? Okay, let's see it. One, you got two fingers, Peter. Is that two, two, oh, one hand, okay. One, two, three, let's see, four, five, six, seven. Thank you, sweetie. Eight, thank you, Mary Jane. Nine, ten, there you go, big guy. That's how you get blessed. Ten, eleven. Okay, that's 11. Now, can't go any lower than this, $100. Let me see the, all the $100 folks. I'm gonna give you a chance to put your hand up and exercise that arm. $100 folks, $100 folks. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. Is that it? 28. I knew somebody was holding out. 27, 20, is that what I say? 27, 28. All right, 28. I need two more people. Two more hundred. Uh, 29 and 30 is, who's the, who's the 31? 30, 31, 32. Okay. Okay. Tell me what you got. Okay. You're short by 7,000. No, actually six. Short by six. How many of you will pray with me and ask the Lord how you might increase the number you gave between now and this coming next week. Would you pray that way? Not a hard prayer, is it? Let's pray. Come on. Everybody on their feet. How many of you know you guys still love me? How have you enjoyed the message? Well, say the same person who just preached to you is the same person that just took money from you. Father, I bless your people today. May there not be a lack in this house. May there not be any pressure, Lord. May we go away today and say, wow, it was good to be in the house of God. May we go away refreshed. And may we also find increase in the day ahead. Increase next week. Increase in some supernatural way. God, bring increase to your people. So that, Lord, what we've done today will just be a launch pad for what we'll be able to do later. Father, we thank you. Thank you for those that are ministered to today. And thank you for this house. We love this house. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Now look at somebody. Look at somebody. 
Get real focused. Look at them. Say, I really like you. God bless you. Sing to the Lord. Bring that offering now.